Hello and welcome to the About to Interview podcast. I'm your host, that guy named John. This is a supplemental version of the About to Interview podcast, which drops every Wednesday and covers movies, TV shows, film festivals, and more. You can follow the podcast on all forms of social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at About to Review. And make sure to subscribe on iTunes slash Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, Blueberry, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. This show focuses solely on the conversations that I have with authors, directors, actors, and creators, and is available on YouTube as well as subscribing to the podcast. Make sure to click the subscribe button below, give a thumbs up, and check out the full show notes with links to the guests at abouttoreview.com. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Sitting with me now is Morgan Neville, uh, here as part of the Seattle International Film Festival with the amazing documentary called Won't You Be My Neighbor? Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So one of the things about this documentary that was incredible, not just being Mr. Rogers and anybody in the past 50 years Mm -hmm. knows Mr. Rogers. What I really liked is one of the quotes he said near the beginning was that his first language was music. That was how he could have his emotional expression. What was your first language when it comes to things like that? And how has it made its way into your work? My first language was probably Mr. Rogers. (laughs) (laughs) Right? Because I was born in 1967. His show started in 1968, beginning Mm -hmm. of 68. So I was like Gen 1 Mr. Rogers fan. The OG Mr. Rogers fan. The original black and white Mr. Rogers fan. Right? Um, so I feel like he was there for me, you know, from the beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, and I loved the show as a kid and watched it for years. Um, so I feel like maybe I had, I had his help um, along with a lot of other things. You know, and I'm a musician. I've made a lot of films about music. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think I just bonded spiritually with Fred, you know, talking about music and understanding the power of music, too. And, and even though the film's not about music, music was a big part of his story and of Absolutely. this story. He wrote every song on the show for 200 well, wrote songs. wrote it, performed most of it. Yeah. <laughs> wow. It's kind of amazing. Uh, he was a composition major in college, too. I mm-hmm. mean, music was very important to him. It's very important to me. So music has always been therapeutic for me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and Fred Rogers is kind of the perfect um, synthesis <laughs> of all of those things. You know, emotional healing and music and you know and so much more excellent yeah. so as as an accomplished documentarian uh you know the little thing like an oscar that you won yeah. you know those types of things when you start getting into these documentaries and with a lot of these there's always kind of a dark underbelly you know there is some sort of truth that needs to be exposed with this was there any concern going into it of like What am I going to find? Especially being, like you said, an OG Mr. Rogers fan from the very beginning. What was that kind of anticipation like, or was that was there any tension? Yeah, I'm. When I first started the film, the first trip I took to Pittsburgh because he lived in Pittsburgh. He did Mm -hmm. the show in Pittsburgh. It was a big part of him and who he was. Um, So the first trip I took down there, I got in a taxi and I explained to the driver what I was doing in Pittsburgh. And everybody in Pittsburgh has their own Mr. Rogers of story. Of course, yeah. <laughs> um, but the, the cab driver turned around and said, you better not screw this up. Oh, no pressure. Um, and I heard that echoed many, many times over the course of making the mm. film. Because I think there is this expectation almost that our heroes have these skeletons in their closet. And we've right. seen so many people kind of fall from grace, as it were. Um, that people expect there to be something like that about Fred Rogers. And particularly, he was such a unique character that people Mm -hmm. couldn't ever 
take him at face value. So he had there had to be something. Oh, like lurking, nobody lurking. is that yeah perfect. <laughs> and and I think really the big reveal is that that he was exactly that person. And in fact, not even not even just that he, Mr. Rogers and Fred Rogers are the same person, but that Fred Rogers was actually a more impressive person than Mr. Rogers. Because right. he was more dimensional, more willful, more um, intellectual, and all of these things that what he did um, was incredibly profound, even though it was simple and it was perceived as simple. And I think that's one of the reasons he became kind of a punchline is he's kind of right. the quintessential milk toast cardboard character mm -hmm. but in fact he was a really deep character and people often mistake um simple for superficial absolutely one of yeah. my other childhood heroes other than mr rogers is superman and it is that yeah. same type of thing you know he is yeah. nicknamed the boy scout you know nobody can be that yeah. perfect but there are those people very rare it seems like these days when you talk about it in the documentary that were the same. Mr. Rogers was Fred Rogers. Yeah. And so what really becomes the central tension then and what makes him human is that he doubted himself at every turn. Right. That he doubted whether or not his message was getting across. And what he did, you know, it's hard to look around the world today and say, Mr. Rogers succeeded in making us all better neighbors. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, I think the other question is if it weren't for Mr. Rogers, what kind of a society well, would we I, have I do right not now? want to think about that. <laughs> exactly. But I think he's also then a kind of unique character to, to discuss these questions that we've all been talking about, about, you know, how we're all going to get along, you mm -hmm. know, because essentially when you're talking about, won't you be my neighbor, you're talking about, how do we live together in society? I mean, he's talking about things like civility. Mm -hmm. uh, well, and in the yeah. first week of the show, the Vietnam War is starting, and he addresses it in the first week of the show on a children's program. Uh, yeah. I mean, he wasn't timid about these things. No, not so much. <laughs> and in fact, you know, there, we mentioned many things in the film and show clips, but there are many, many more. I mm -hmm. mean, it, it was something, you know, really, I think about the land of make-believe um, is like a parable machine. <laughs> yeah. That whatever the issue was, he would find a way through, through the puppets mm -hmm. and the characters to essentially help children process it. Because that's really what he was trying to do. That what he understood was that there are all kinds of bad things out there. Mm -hmm. And it can be death or bullying or even assassinations, uh, as he deals with, that but that the worst thing we can have and instill in children is fear mm -hmm. because fear, you know, festers and becomes and it is resentment and pervasive. anger and hatred. And, mm -hmm. you know, it becomes all these other terrible things. So what he wanted to do was help, you know, squash it at, at the beginning, which is how do I address the fear of these things? So one way of doing that was to tell these parables mm -hmm. about why bad things happen how we learn from them how we should feel about them and then he comes back and sums it up in a song you know and in a way i feel like uh, to me as an adult today you know that feels like pretty good therapy for me yeah <laughs> so absolutely uh maybe the the network news should do more of that these days um right but uh but i think that's what was so powerful about it is it he was he took kids incredibly seriously mm -hmm. and in doing that actually kind of spoke not only to children but to to all of us i mean the kind of the processing children need to do for these fears and insecurities are the same things we need to do as adults and we tend to bottle these things up and you know and let them fester right you know and yeah. so i mean speaking of you know the land of make believe and and all of those things with 31 seasons and 912 total episodes, kind of what were those key components that you were kind of digging for in all of that archival, incredible archival footage? I mean, what's interesting is that on its surface, the show never changed. <laughs> you know? Right. You know, he came in every day, he took off the coat, he put on the sweater, put on the sneakers, 
the trolley took you to land a make believe, mm -hmm. and then you came back. So superficially, you could play thirty one years of episodes on a loop. Mm -hmm. However, what <laughs> interested me was when you actually look up close under a microscope, you see it did change. <laughs> And it, right. they're subtle changes, but the changes speak volumes both about Fred and about the times. And I think Fred always wanted the show to develop. I mean, that we tell the story in the film that he actually stopped making episodes for a couple of mm -hmm. years. In, Which I did not even realize because yeah. all my life it was... It was there because it was yeah. syndicated the whole time. Right. He had stopped making episodes. But in 1976, he stopped making episodes because he thought, I've talked about everything kids are feel fearful of, and I've done enough episodes that you can play enough episodes so that a child can make it through those years without seeing a repeat. That, right. was, that was his goal. Mm -hmm. What he realized after a couple of years was that there were many things he hadn't addressed. Mm -hmm. There were more problems coming. Society was changing. So for instance, um, a lot of people wrote to him and said, it's very important for you to do something about divorce. Right. And it took him five years to figure out how to address divorce. And he ended up doing a week of episodes about divorce, which right. are incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. But I think it was an understanding that as times were changing and the world around children were changing, that he had to, he had to change too. So the show actually became much more kind of willful and mm -hmm. um, took on the challenge much more strongly in the 80s. So the 80s episodes are actually even more forceful than the ones mm -hmm. from the 70s. Wow. And then the, the last two questions, mm -hmm. these are the philosophical questions you know, that I warned you about before I started recording. So the first one, if you were to have a puppet that would be your kind of mouthpiece, you know, how he had Daniel Stripe a tiger, what would that puppet be? You know, I think it would be some kind of a, an animal that was a seeker. Mm. You know, okay. like a... A badger, maybe. Okay. <laughs> badger puppet. <laughs> so a seeker, but also vicious if cornered. Yeah. Okay. Vicious if cornered, but uh, yeah, I, it's something, you know, I feel like what I do for a living is um, seek things out, mm -hmm. you know, and I feel like the most important character trait you can have being a documentary filmmaker is to be curious. So, Absolutely. Um, so some kind of a seeking badger puppet. <laughs> okay, nice. Uh, and then tying into some of your other recent work, yeah. on Netflix, you helped produce Ugly Delicious, mm -hmm. a cooking show. So in thinking about Won't You Be My Neighbor and how so many people are going to have memories mm -hmm. attached to it and it is going to transport them to places where they remember watching it. Now tying in food, yeah. how would you describe Mr. Rogers as far as a meal? What type of meal would this experience be? Well, it's funny because um, to me, they're actually both about a similar idea, fundamentally. Like, mm -hmm. it's an idea I come back to in many things I work on, which is the idea of common ground and culture as a vehicle for common ground. Food is a way of bringing people together. Absolutely. And Mr. Rogers is a character that brings people together. He supersedes those divisions. So... I think that meal would be a big communal bowl of something where everybody could sit around and share together from from the table. So maybe a, uh, you know, he was a vegetarian too. Really? Yeah, because he said he never wanted to eat anything that had a mother. Fascinating. <laughs> That's a very Mister Rogers idea. Absolutely. So how about um, a vegetarian Chinese meal around a lazy Susan with a bunch of people? I think that would be the uh, the Mister Rogers meal. Fantastic. <laughs> Perfect answer. Uh, so thank you so much for, for taking the time. I know that you are very busy with everything. So the film is Won't You Be My Neighbor. It is hitting theaters soon in various markets after making a festival run. So thank you so much, Morgan sure. Neville, for taking the time. Thanks. And here in Seattle, June 15th. Yes, June 15th. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat.